You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now present the Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Welcome to the Health Hub on Radio Maria Canada, exploring cutting-edge health and wellness information and therapies, helping you to take your health to the next level. I am your host, Kathy Biasse, and I am a holistic nutritionist and a professional cancer coach. Our guest on today's show is Neil Cannon, and we are talking about vitality and its reflection of health and wellness. Neil is the founder of Vitality Secret and the author of the best-selling book, The Vitality Secret. He has been living a semi-nomadic lifestyle, working around the world where kite surfing is possible, including Los Angeles, Bali, Brazil, and now southern Baja, Mexico. After stumbling upon his cure for eczema that he long suffered from, Neil created a coaching program through which he has helped people reverse engineer a myriad of ailments they are going through by addressing the physical, mental, emotional, and energetic pillars of vitality. We haven't talked really too much directly about vitality. It's a very interesting show. We talk about what actually vitality is and its place in health and wellness, um, Neil's four pillars for vitality, and how epigenetics fits into vitality. Stick with us. We will be back in just a few minutes to talk with Neil Cannon. You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now continue with the program, The Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Welcome back, everybody. Today's show has been recorded. No opportunity for calling in. Please do follow us on our social sites. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we are at The Health Hub RMC on those locations. Neil, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. I'm excited for our conversation. So am I. So am I. What brought you to the health space? You know, was this something that you grew up with? This is not something I, I grew up with. Actually, this is something which was a new path. It was an inflection point, if you like, that took me on this path. As I'm sure you are aware, just about everyone who works in holistic health comes with their own story of healing mm-hmm. or recovery. And I'm one of those people. I had uh, pretty bad eczema from a very young age, from a toddler. And for the best part of 30 years, I was given what can only be prescri- um, described as symptom masking treatments. So steroid creams, which have left pigmentation on my skin, prescription moisturizers, which um, when you look at the ingredients, it's really not um, good, good good ingredients. They're harmful, let's put it that way. And antibiotics when it got really bad. When I had a really bad flare-up, I was often prescribed antibiotics. So none of these treatments really address why the eczema was there in the first place. And it wasn't until my father suffered a stroke when I had my wake-up call, if you like, because I was I was convinced his stroke was avoidable. I just had this inner knowing, this like innate intelligence was telling me this stroke was avoidable. I guess it came from some kind of knowledge as well, because I did see this word inflammation in various books I was reading. And I remember him a few years prior to his stroke being told he had chronic inflammation by his sister, who's a naturopathic doctor. She had tested his blood. And I remember distinctly where we were in the family home. He was making making us tea, actually, and... He just said, I've got chronic inflammation, apparently. Don't know, that, don't know what that is. And then a few years later, he had this stroke. So um, I just decided to go on a bit of a, a research quest. And I wanted to kind of prove my inner knowing correct, if you will, if you will that um, his he, he could have easily avoided this stroke, really. And that's what I found to be true. So um, very quickly, I found that chronic inflammation was the underlying cause of his hypertension that led to his stroke, 
the asthma, which he'd had since 12, and also the eczema that I'd had for the best part of my life by that point. So I went about some dietary changes, some lifestyle changes, and addressed the inflammation which was underlying the eczema. And very quickly, my eczema went away. And since 2015, I've been helping others with very, very similar principles to get rid of various chronic inflammatory health conditions. So that's my story in a nutshell. So many paths we could go down here. Uh, you know, I'm taking yeah. a course right now. I'm in the middle of a course on on inflammation, and um, it's it's an inflammation course, and you know, dealing with genes and things like that, and and a little bit more in depth on the inflammation pathways and things like that. The first thing that popped into my mind when you were talking is your story is one of hope because um, the body can heal even after you know, what you have been through. And that must be one of the, the 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 cornerstones that you rely on when you're talking to people. Would that be correct? Oh, absolutely. This is one of the main reasons I do what I do. And also have my own podcast, because I interview people who reverse the so-called incurable illnesses. Hmm. These are the illnesses where Western medicine has no answer, or they just put you on drugs. And they say there's no they they'll say there's no cure for this. But what they really mean is drugs or surgery won't cure this. Let's what they could actually say at the same time is look, there's other forms of medicine out there. This form of medicine doesn't cure. However, the body is designed to heal itself, mm-hmm. as you just angled at. And yeah, so much hope. I'm fascinated with people who reverse the incurable because it just shows what the body is capable of. So, so many of my conversations with people go back to this, um, treating symptoms only. Uh, if you could, w- what are the pillars that you say that you would say that you rest upon when you're taking somebody through this journey of health? Um, you know, you know, we all have our ways of going at it. What would you say is your, your path and your pillars? when you're working with a client to help them um, get their body back into good health? I love this question because it's actually what my latest book is about. It's the four pillars of vitality, I call them. So I call them the physical, mental, emotional, and energetic. And I can I can go through them if you like, um, just kind of detailing them very briefly if you like. Would that be helpful? Oh, absolutely. And do you, uh, before you get into this, um, do you rank them as one being more important or a starting point? That's a really good question. It really depends on the individual because some people might start this journey. Well, let's just say most people start this journey with the physical because mm-hmm. it's the most tangible. When we're looking at nutrition and gut health and exercise and sunlight and grounding and detoxification that's where most people start because it's most tangible that said some people can go straight straight through to the energy piece start meditating and visualizing and attend meditation retreats and heal themselves so it really it really depends where a person is Mm -hmm. um and some people have approached me and said look i've got i've got diet and exercise completely sorted can we just focus on the spiritual and that's what we will do and i have done that before with with clients i would say for the most part though people start with with the physical i I agree and you know when i'm trying to explain i was actually talking to my son about this and uh he was saying mom i thought nutrition you know your nutritionist i thought nutrition was a piece and i said you know the more i work with people the more i delve into the the whole healing of the body the more, you know, and I think what you said is perfect. People go for the tangible. That's the thing they can grab onto. It's, it's, yes. it's the easy piece. But the more I think these other pillars that you are talking about, either we're not focusing on them enough or they're not appreciated enough. And so that's why I think the pillars that you have are fascinating. So please do go through them and, and give us your, your plan of attack with each. Yes. Thank you. So the physical comprises nutrition anti-inflammatory nutrition, figuring out what the person's eating that could be causing inflammation in the body, causing potentially leaky gut in the case of autoimmune conditions, and um, really dialing that in and replacing inflammatory food types with good food types and taking out toxins and putting in fuel, ultimately. So 
Nutrition is super important and many people can get amazing results with nutrition alone. The exercise piece is really important. If we're not active, there are so many functions in the body that just don't work. Um, as I once heard that sedentarianism is uh, costing lives. And we've heard mm-hmm. things like sitting is the new smoking. If we're not moving, if we're not oxygenating our cells, we're also not detoxifying the body. So if someone has a chronic illness and they're sedentary, we, they must start moving and finding a way to enjoy that because we actually can enjoy moving um if if we focus on something well that we enjoy mm-hmm. it might be dancing it might be going for a walk in nature it might be swimming in the ocean whatever it is but we need to get moving because our cells require certain fuels first and foremost they require oxygen secondly they require hydration pure purest of water money can buy three they require nutrients four they require the ability to eliminate waste they have to be able to detoxify and our cells also require grounding they require sleep so um it's really kind of going through these um essential cell fuels making sure they're covered by nutrition and exercise and um we also look into detoxification so the the body might have toxins in it already so we need to figure out if there are any toxins in the body and we also need to figure out if we're exposed to any toxins external environmental toxins can be causing people um challenges right now uh, well right now and forever um uh, there's a particular environmental toxin that i often bring up quite early on now and that's electromagnetic frequencies emfs so um we've just gone from 4g to 5g and it's a completely different uh frequency and there were reports very early on of people suffering from all, all kinds of conditions of course the mainstream media didn't cover any of this because it doesn't um but we our cells are very sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies and this goes back we've got data we've got tens of thousands of studies uh detailing this um going back many many years now in fact the world health organization in 2011 classified emfs as a potential carcinogen Mm-hmm. so that they're already aware of it so we need to see if someone is exposed to emfs uh, or rather everyone's exposed to emfs if someone is sensitive to them particularly and if someone is right next to a cell tower for example that could be something to consider um either protecting yourself from or moving away from which mm-hmm. is obviously quite a drastic move but people are doing it that's what's happening so um environmental toxins is a huge one there could be other kind of pollutions as well that you could be near a chemical plant or or you know pesticides herbicides fungicides insecticides from farming could be spraying onto your house something like that so that's that's the physical pillar in a nutshell do you have any questions before i move on no i, I mean you're 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 preaching to the choir here and uh, okay. especially this <laughs> movement piece and i you know the one thing i think is um uh, when people t- try to jump on to to these these pillars here the two that you've talked about it doesn't have to be a complete hard left you know movement doesn't have so to sorry. mean you know you're you're setting up for a marathon it's amazing how much we don't move um and and it's it's right exactly what you're saying just do something you like to start off with because then your body Absolutely. will talk to you and your body will you know once you start doing the positive it craves the positive so and, true yeah and you just just start just start okay i don't want to disturb you anymore on you go <laughs> I, I, yeah, I just want to second that. What you just said is so key. Your your body gives, your body craves more of what you give it. So we can either give it stuff that is really good for it, or we give it stuff that's not good for it. <laughs> and if, if we give it this movement, if we exercise it, it actually craves more exercise. If we start drinking green juices, weirdly enough, it starts to create crave more green juices, mm-hmm. and. Um, it's it's just interesting you get this reward from exercise very very quickly and you absolutely um, do exercise yeah. is just so important just so important it is it is and we can't outsource it no it's really something we we must do and well if- you know and, and to this end neil uh, something i'd say all the time is we are responsible for our own health whether yeah. it's asking the right questions seeking the right professional so outsourcing should be something that is 
part of the piece of our health, but not the entirety of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, absolutely. We can't outsource some fundamentals of what the body mm-hmm. craves. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And so the next so, pillars, like the next two pillars are a little bit more in the esoteric space, right? Well, the mental and emotional piece are less esoteric. Um, in fact, they're scientific. Mm-hmm. So let's focus on the mental piece first. I mean, this is this is ultimately the most important one because it's our brain that's controlling everything that we do. Absolutely. Um, so if the first thing I like to do with my clients, whether I work with them one on one or in a group, is help them get clear on a vision, their vision, like their vitality vision. What do they want to bring into their lives? What, um, how do they want to feel? What kind of energy do they want? How is that going to impact? every other area of their life. How's it going to impact their personal relationships, their relationships with children, if they have any, or their work life, you know, just trying to attach vitality to how it impacts our life in every way, shape and form. And the purpose of this is really to create an inspiring vision. So they can be pulled forward by this guiding light, if you like, rather than be motivated. I, I see motivation as this um, kind of fear response where we're operating out of kicking ourselves into action. And um, inspiration is, I, I see it as something being, we're kind of pulled towards. Mm-hmm. So um, the, the mental piece is really key, getting clear on your why and why, you know, and attaching that to our innate needs and desires And I've got a powerful process for that, actually. The other piece about the mental is, and this is really more about the body, our thoughts can make us vital. Thoughts can make us sick. A lot of people can relate to how chronic stress leads to illness. And in fact, it's often spoken about how 90% of chronic illness is down to chronic stress. And what we're not really thinking about is what's, what what is stress and um this is also tied in with the emotional piece of course our thoughts are very closely connected with our stress response so if we're thinking negative thoughts or let's just say stressful thoughts on a regular basis we end up living by the hormones of stress and then we start creating weakness in our bodies in our immune systems in our guts so When we think about this and the placebo effect, most people can get their head around the placebo effect or understand it at least. You know, we take this pill that's an inert substance on a regular basis. And through the sheer power of belief, we we literally create this concoction of chemicals in the body conducive to healing. Our brain is like a chemist, in the words of cell biologist Bruce Lipton. Our brain chemists signals an emotion which triggers a cascade of chemicals and hormones and this beautiful perfect concoction of chemicals which heals the body and it is scientifically proven now that the body can heal through thought alone the placebo effect is proving that we can heal through thought alone so when we understand the placebo effect it really helps us use it (laughs) and what i also help my people become aware of is the nocebo effect are you familiar with the nocebo effect Mm -hmm, i am of course you're the choir (laughs) so it's um the opposite of the placebo effect so if if we can think ourselves vital and we can think ourselves well and symptom free we can also do the opposite so if we wake up every day with the same thoughts same feelings then we end up recreating exactly what our past and if we wake up and tell ourselves we have symptom x you know i'll use myself as an example if i wake up every day talk about you know recognize maxima thinking about maxima and and connect to it like it's mine like it's an identity then guess what i can recreate the whole thing again Mm -hmm. so what i like to do is help my or encourage my clients or readers or customers uh, whoever they are to friends and family to disassociate from whatever symptom they are experiencing like the symptoms is there as a warning light i see it as a warning light like your your car dashboard not warning light on it's a symptom that the body is presenting to you to indicate some change is necessary 
So let's not get attached to it because that can create the nocebo effect. So I like to disassociate from labels, from associations, and um, really help my clients understand the power of the placebo effect. I was going to say positive thinking, but it's more than that. Mm -hmm. It's it's important, but it's more than that. It's understanding the brain chemist and, and the sheer power of the governor of our cells, which is the brain, to create healing or the opposite. So the, the mental piece is huge. Um, so that's the mental piece. Any any uh, questions before I go on to the emotional? No, I, I totally agree. And it's so easy for people to see how negative thoughts affect us physically. You know, you get up on that stage and you're anxious and you're nervous and your tummy's upset. I just find it very, and, and it's it's happened in my own life as well. We can look down the negative path very easily, um, but we can't seem to be as aggressive in the positive path. And, and to me, this is the key piece of health that we really need to be drumming because where our mental health goes, so does our nutrition go. So does our, our, our physical health go. If, if we're in that negative space and creating this environment of negativity in our body, no matter what other positive things we're doing, nutrition wise, movement wise, they're just not as effective. So I think this exactly. is such a key piece, such a key piece. Yes, absolutely. And weirdly, we are we are wired for survival. Like we that's kind of how we are wired. And a go-to response is actually a fear response. Mm-hmm. And also, a, to add insult into injury, the hormones of stress are addictive. So it's easier to go down the spiral of negative thinking than it is positive thinking. It's like it is actually harder. So we need to get good at not doing that and becoming conscious of our thoughts. And this is how meditation is super helpful because you can start to become more conscious and aware of the thoughts that you have on a daily basis. And then you can, you can catch yourself thinking, hang on, is this, is this serving me? Is this even real? Where does this thought come from? And um, it's a very useful skill to have to become aware of our thoughts and our emotions because we weren't taught this stuff growing up. I didn't. I, I didn't learn this stuff at school or at university. I learned this stuff through my wake up call mm-hmm. <laughs> and diving into this realm and becoming passionate and enthusiastic about personal development and personal growth and changing my psychology. And none of this stuff is mainstream, so I wasn't aware that I was in control of my thoughts. And my emotions. That was new to me. And it's a practice. It's not something that, okay, I'm there. I'm done. Uh, exactly. It's it's constant because as life changes, these thoughts come into your into your headspace, and it's something that you have to deal with constantly. Neil, we have one more pillar to deal with, don't we? We actually have two more. We have the emotional and the energetic piece. Okay, so well, what I've, we're going to do is take a quick break here now. We're going to okay. come back and deal with those two or get um, your understanding of those two. I think it's an important thing. You are listening to The Health Hub, here on Radio Maria Canada, a Catholic voice wherever you are. To contact us and be a part of the show, email thh at radiomaria.ca. We now continue with the program. Here once again is your host, Kathy Biasi. So, Neil, in the second segment of the show, I will definitely want to finish up on these um, these two pillars and then uh, take us down the vitality pathway. And, and, you know, this is the premise for everything you do is cracking this vitality code. So let's finish the, the last two pillars um, and move on to that. Perfect. Sounds good. So emotional, we've covered some of it with the mental piece mm-hmm. and we mentioned stress Something, um, and we talked about being in control of our thoughts and our emotions. Something I love to talk about is stress, because this was never explained to me as well growing up, that stress isn't what we think it is, or most people think it is. It's one of my favorite definitions I came across was stress is our internal response to external strains. In other words, it's how we perceive our world. It's not the events themselves that cause the stress. Mm -hmm. It's how we perceive our world. It's how we perceive these events. It's our perception. 
So I always use the traffic jam example. Two people can be in a traffic jam, um, both unexpectedly late for work, and one person can remain completely calm, collected, listen to music, listen to a podcast, maybe your podcast, <laughs> and and just chill out and enjoy that time. And their nervous system and body remains calm and um, optimal. Another person can be in exactly the same circumstance and start getting what we know as stressed and reactive and start weaving in in traffic, weaving in and out of traffic and swearing and cutting people up, causing road rage maybe. Mm -hmm. And you can virtually envisage what's happening in their face and neck, the, the, the blood rushes to the face and veins start popping out of the neck and forehead and you know what's happened to the blood pressure of that person. So that's a response which is entirely um, the choice of the person who has reacted that way. Absolutely. So we, I, I like to use that example because I think we can all relate to it. And 20 years ago, I used to be that guy. Um, I would not to that extreme, but you know, I, I would let that, uh, I would let traffic really. Um, cause me emotional distress when when in fact it's just part cause so, so um well we have to have like a flexibility of thought too in that situation yeah. right like you, you know you can't just focus on i'm going to be late for work you know the thought process to avoiding the stress is what can i take positively from that that again another learned thing and uh it, you know these things are not easy to do by any means they're not easy to do. And so I like to use the word surrender. You know, if we're in a traffic jam, there's really nothing we can do. So we may as well just chill mm-hmm, and see exactly. and see what happens next. I, uh, I, w- I wrote a piece on, on social a few days ago about a recent kite surfing problem I got myself into. I was a mile out from the shore. My kite went down because someone else tangled their lines around mine. And, well, I, I, I must accept responsibility. I guess I was part of it because my lines were also there, but I believe it was his mistake. It doesn't really matter. We got our lines tangled, and it's never happened to me in 20-odd years of kiting. Anyway, initially, I had a, let's call it a fear response, and I might have sworn once or twice. <laughs> and, then, and then I thought, you know what? That's going to get me nowhere. And I just completely relaxed into the situation and just – took some deep breaths and I was like, right, I need to get this back to shore now because I was ahead of him and I I basically sailed us both back to shore, both kites on the water. And it was a really beautiful lesson that what happens when we just relax, the two of us somehow managed, because we're connected to each other, we somehow managed to communicate with each other above the wind noise and we, we teamwork got us back. And then the cool thing was I was picked up by a guy on a jet ski and then we went around looking for the board and then we got back to the beach and I asked him for his name and he said his name was Jesus. And in my head I went, your name's not Jesus, it's Jesus. <laughs> and you just saved me on a jet ski. So I'm going to call you <laughs> Jesus on a jet ski. Jesus on a jet ski. <laughs> <laughs> you like know, it is, you, you, it, this is a perfect <laughs> example that, that you just don't arrive at this, this, this Zen-ness. It's a constant, we're human. Uh, but again, it's the more you practice it, the more you can get quicker to that state of mind totally so yeah the the emotional piece is huge the other the other really important piece of the emotional pillar is releasing trapped emotions and trauma and this piece is arguably in my opinion one of the most important pieces to to address first and foremost because it's almost well, in the vast majority of illnesses, I would say, are actually rooted in trauma. And when this was first explained to me, I don't know, five, seven years ago, I wasn't, let's just say, ready to hear it. I wasn't at the right frequency to hear it. I actually attended the Truth About Cancer Live Symposium in Texas mm-hmm. in 2016. I, I dived down the cancer research um, realm because I lost three friends to it in one year in 2015 and I, I like my inner knowing of my father suffering unnecessarily I had this inner knowing that my friends didn't have to die from cancer and I, I just knew that it wasn't what the mainstream tells us that it is so I started reading books on it and attending seminars and I went to this live event and there was one particular talk 
where they were talking, they showed this imagery of different types of cancer related to different emotions in different organs. And I'm going to be completely open with you. I wasn't ready to hear it. It didn't, it didn't make sense to me. I couldn't put two and two together. I couldn't think, how can an emotion create a physical illness in the body? I just wasn't ready to hear it. And it wasn't until a few years later when I had my own challenge again, when I started to uh, understand the physics of emotions and how emotions are stored like electromagnetic bundles of energy in the body. We are electromagnetic beings. We're frequency beings. When we zoom in enough, we are 99.999 many nines empty space or energy and zero point many zeros one matter. So when we understand that us at that subatomic level, at the quantum level, if you like, it starts to become easier to understand how emotions are also energy. They are literally trapped emotions or trauma. They're the same thing. And this trauma can get stored anywhere in the body, in any organ, any joints, anywhere in the body, fascia, psoas muscles, lower back, migra- head for migraines, anywhere. And there's a wonderful slogan that I say in virtually every podcast and in my book. It is the organs weep the tears the eyes refuse to shed. It's William Osler. Do you know that one? I don't. That's lovely. Yeah, I love it. So if we don't allow this energy to leave the body, what actually happens is it compromises our electrical body because we're actually wired up like a house and it drops the voltage to the organs which are affected. So um, that's slightly technical, but let's just think of it as a, think of us wired up like a house with different organs on different circuits in the body. And um, all of these circuits, by the way, go through our teeth, which act like circuit breakers. Again, a bit technical, but let's just, let's just, Assume that's correct. Um, When we understand this, and then we we understand that emotions drop the voltage, it's as if they stop the power going to your light. Let's Let's say a light in your home starts flickering. An electrician would reverse engineer why that light is flickering, what's happening in the circuitry, and then it'd figure out maybe a dodgy cable or a faulty light switch. I used to be an electrician, by the way, so when I figured this all out, it was like the penny dropped. <laughs> and um, we, we can actually think, we can reverse engineer why the body gets sick by understanding fundamentals, um, kind of, I wouldn't say basic principles, but principles of the body electric. We can understand how we can reverse engineer chronic illness. So emotions get stored like electromagnetic bundles of energy. And when we release them, we allow the energy to flow around the body again. So I've said a lot there, but I, I just well, I had, I had a there. teacher who said, um, and she she this was part of the course, saying that the key word to emotions is motion, and they are meant to travel um, and right. do what they're supposed to do learn you know we take what we we need from them and then out of the body and i've always remembered that uh, I, and you know what this stuff that we're talking about neil it's not so far out of reach anymore because i no. do hear um the medical space it might just be uh, one or two that you come in contact with but reference things like positive thinking and you know so it's coming it's coming. Yeah. Yes, it is. There is a transition happening. I can feel it as well. Well, um, and that's, you know, people like you are doing this, you know, pushing and you know, people seeing results and it, it, it can't be denied. It can't be denied. Ex- exactly. Results speak. Evidence speaks. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I, when I talk about the emotional pillar, there are many ways to release trapped emotions. And we don't have to go and do talk therapy. That can actually end up being counterproductive. It Mm -hmm. can actually make problems worse. There's a a term in neuroscience that says nerve cells that fire together wire together. Meaning that if we start talking about a traumatic event, guess what? It can get, it can get more of a problem. It actually becomes a bigger thing, which is the very opposite of what we want to do. And the more we give something attention, the more we give it energy. And the more it expands. 
So yeah. we uh, want, that's I, I talked to, to somebody. I had somebody on the show. We were talking about this. Uh, the exact same thing is it bringing up past. We were talking with PTSD and vets, and um, I mean, I think uh, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist, and I don't work in this space. But a lot of the the approaches were to relive the event to try and and flush it out. And this particular person said that they did not think that that was a valuable approach. So very much supporting what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big piece. And um, I, that's why I love somatic therapy because you can release the energy associated with memories without talking about them. Mm-hmm. There's a number of processes that, that do that. Um, I know I don't have time now, but let's just say there are because there are. And I just want to say that because it gives us hope. We don't have to go and talk about events because most people don't really want to do that. And right. I can totally understand that. And so can I. Um, we. What if we could test the body with a bit of kinesiology, find out the names of the emotions, when they were stored, where they were stored, and then release it without even going to the memory at all? Because that's one process that I use. Hmm, so, that's a very um, interesting premise. Yeah, yeah. I like to give credit where it's due. Um, Dr. Bradley, <laughs> Dr. Bradley Nelson, he wrote the emotion code. It's one of my favorite techniques. Excellent. Which I use with my clients. Yeah. Um, so the final piece, I know we're up against the, the clock here. The final piece, oh, by the way, do, do you have any other questions before we go into the next one? No, no, but let's, let's get through these because they're very, very interesting. So the final one is the energy piece. And I, I consider this pillar almost like a reward <laughs> because there is so much exciting stuff that opens up for us the moment we enter into this world of energy like like i said in the last pillar description we are energy beings and we have what can only be described as superpowers and the more that we dive into this realm of energy and understand the power of meditation the science of meditation the data of meditation, we start to understand how we can heal the body through meditation. And um, this is when things get really interesting because we, this, the science is telling us how powerful meditation is. I've recently been to a couple of Dr. Joe Dispenza events actually in Cancun, his advanced week long retreats where people have been attending these events for many, many years. They have data to show that people have attended and reversed the most incurable of illnesses you could possibly think of in a matter of days, spontaneous remissions, multiple brain tumors disappearing, people with really advanced metastasized cancer disappearing in days, handicapped people walking again, deaf people hearing again, blind people seeing again. It's, it's quite remarkable and it sounds too good to be true. It sounds like miracles and what I'd like to say is when when you start to understand the formula that we we go through with the visualization, create, creating coherence between our heart brains and our head brains, our heart actually has a brain in it, about 40,000 sensory neurites. When we create this coherent state between our hearts and our brains, our head brains, magic happens in the body. And then when we immerse ourselves into a meditative state for extended periods of time, it's as if this force comes through and heals the body. This magical intelligence that created all of us and life on Earth is healing us. And scientists can confirm that there is new information that appears in the blood of meditators. And they've, they've, they've confirmed this. Mm-hmm. And at Dr. Joe's, Dr. Joe's events, he says, okay, Mr. Scientist, can you confirm that there's new information in the blood? The blood carries information. That's how we can test the blood to see if we're sick or not. And there's evidence, absolute undeniable evidence of thousands of these new metabolites and anti-cancer metabolites and um, this, all these different technical terms of pieces of information which I can't recite right now, but this, let's just say it's positive <laughs> and it's appearing in the blood and they are dumbfounded as to how, where this information came from. So they scientists confirm that it's there. And when Dr. Joe says, so where does it come from? They say, well, focusing on nothing, apparently. And of course, the room is in hysterics at that point because we've just been spending many, many days focusing the on nothing. The Seinfeld show. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> So um, 
it's just fun once we get into this world and knowing that the body can heal that fast and what's available to us witnessing other people we were healing each other with our hands as well and i was doing this long before joe Dispenza, doing hand healing and reiki healing and stuff helping people get rid of pain and and also in one case get, getting rid of a very um severe symptom so we do have power to heal one another with our hands and we were doing this at the event we were separated into all these different healing pods imagine 1700 people it's separated into pods of eight with a he Lee in the middle. Uh, I'm quoting air quotes, he Lee. And then four people either side called he Luz. And um, there we, we were directing energy onto the people in the middle. And by the way, this was meticulously carried out. There was m- many, many hours of preparation. We were put into this incredible state. We were in this heart and brain coherent state. We did more walking meditation to embody the energy of a healer. We all, and it was just absolutely phenomenal. And a lot of people were just in tears the moment we entered the room because the, the energy was just off the charts. And I um, think this is a hard part for people to grasp, but I've been a part yeah, of it. Uh, yeah. You know, when you get a number of people together in prayer, a number of people together in song, you feel the energy. You can feel yes. it with a particular person. You know, a person can walk into the room and and just ignite a room with their positive energy and another person can walk into a room and suck it out. And these are evident. So it, but it's just, it's just actually trying to understand this and, and move into that space and allow us to try and grasp this as part of healing. I think it's, this is what I meant by es- esoteric, not so much that it was yes. science-based, but it's something that there's a belief you have to have until yes. it until it does translate into the body is is this what vitality is to you you know you've got you've uh, the vitality secret was your 2016 book and and now vitality code is coming out what does vitality mean to you yeah good question because I, I i asked that question in my book and i i think everyone has their own definition for me vitality really means having the energy and the body to do what we want when we want we're not restricted and we we're not um chronically taking any drugs which deteriorate the the health of the body and we are energized to do what we love to do and be out be outside be in nature and have this energy about us that enables us to um, channel that into areas of our lives which are most important to us. I you actually see, see vitality as vital. life force. Yes. You, you can see someone who's vital um, even in illness versus someone, um, you know, in illness who, you know, is not vital. It's very apparent. It's very apparent. When does your book come out? In about six weeks. Um, it's either six six to eight weeks. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be about six weeks. And you had great so, um, success with your first book. Is this is this like the 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 sequel to the first? Is this completely different? I would say it's the sequel. The first one's more about chronic inflammation. I mean, the second one absolutely touches on chronic inflammation as well. But the first one was getting rid of chronic inflammation, predominantly with nutrition and exercise and managing stress and a bit of grounding. Um, this one is really going much deeper into the physical, mental, emotional, and energetic pillars of vitality. Mm-hmm. And the reason is, you touched on it earlier. Not everyone can heal their body with diet and exercise. So there's something else going on in that case. So a lot of people can. A lot of people can reverse all kinds of symptoms or let's just, you know, quote unquote illnesses, but really chronic symptoms of a chronic underlying cause. Many people can get rid of symptoms with nutrition and exercise. That said, it normally requires going deeper, peeling back the layers of the onion, really finding out what is causing imbalances in the body. So I, I've I've done my best to create what I can call a, a manual. It doesn't have every single answer in it, but it can at least gear people into the right direction and give people areas that they can hone in on and zero in on to focus whatever resonates. Um, 
but I, I've I want to you know using your word of hope earlier I want to give people that hope I want to share with people through my podcast as well and results my clients have had that the body can heal virtually anything I, I believe the body can heal just about everything providing the the environment is touching on epigenetics is conducive to healing we know from the science of epigenetics that the it's the environment in the body that signals the genes it's not the genes that trigger the illness we're not we're not destined by our genes we can create an environment in our body to then signal the genes so epigenetics is like the software the genes are like the hardware epigenetics is running the hardware so if we create the environment in the body which is conducive to healing by creating harmony across all those four pillars the body can heal just about anything and that is my that is my firm belief i, I, I want to say agree within with you. reason I agree yeah. with you too, and and congratulations on the book. And you know, I think that the this is just you know me projecting uh, that people can a lot of people can can get to um, to health focusing on movement, focusing on nutrition. But I don't believe that your four pillars are mutually exclusive. So when you are providing movement, when you are providing good nutrition. I think you're upping the energy. I think you're improving your mental health. So they, they all do come together, just like our body systems. We don't just exist below the neck and above the neck. It's all intertwined. And I congratulate you for pulling it all forward in, in your new book. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Kathy. It's been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it as well. And I totally agree. All of those pillars are interconnected. Absolutely. Well, everybody, we will talk to you next week on The Health Hub.